initially what I wanted to do was to try and talk about everybody who's been involved in shark and ray research. But then I realized that given the time limits and the number of people who've been involved, this would be impossible. So really what I want to focus on is the people who've come before us, the people who've laid the foundations for us uh, to build on. We're very fortunate here in Southern Africa that we've got a very rich um, diversity of, of sharks and rays. And when I say Southern Africa, I'm talking about Namibia and Mozambique included. And you can see that for a relatively short section of coastline, we do very well, particularly in comparison to places like the United States and Australia, which have far longer coastlines. I think what is really significant about our <coughs> Convictian biodiversity is the fact that we have this extremely high percentage, more than 50% of Southern African endemics. And I think that's very important to bear in mind when we are conducting our research, particularly if it's management um, related. If we look back in history, one of the first people we must consider is Carl von Linné, the Swede, or as he was known in Latin, because he did all his writing in Latin. All his scientific descriptions are done in Latin, so his Latin name was in fact Linnaeus. And he was the father of modern taxonomy. He introduced the binomial system. He described 26 different shark and ray species around the world. He made it very, very simple. He slotted them into one of three genera. If they were sharks, they were squalus. If they were rays, they became raja. And if they were chimerids, they became chimera. And he, in fact, described the first South African endemic. And that was chimera calorincus, which is now better known as calorincus capensis. And he was also, incidentally, responsible for first describing the great white shark, which he attributed to the, to the genus Squalus. Obviously, he, like a lot of other um, taxonomists of the time, were based in Europe, and they relied on explorers and naturalists going out into the New World to bring back specimens to <coughs> Europe for description. And that in itself introduced all sorts of amazing challenges, particularly when it come, came to uh, preserving large specimens found in the tropics. Formalin wasn't widely available, and so alcohol tended to be the preferred medium for preservation. But obviously, when it came to pres preserving large animals, particularly things like whale sharks, this uh, posed a huge challenge. Andrew Smith was a Scotsman. He was a son of a shepherd, and he decided to, to best advance his uh, professional career as a doctor. He joined the, the British Army and he was posted to the Cape of Good Hope in 1890. Not because he had any uh, biological interest or qualifications but purely as a, as a medical doctor. When he was in, in Cape Town um, he, he spent not only time in Cape Town but he was posted to uh, the Grahamstown area. He undertook a number of different expeditions up into Natal and into M Namaqualand, and this gave him the perfect opportunity to be able to pursue his interest in natural history. And he was an avid collector, and um, on top of being responsible for uh, administrative and medical duties, he was also uh, appointed as a part-time superintendent or in fact the first director of the South African Museum. Unfortunately he returned to England in, 19, in 1837 and he took with him his vast collection of animals and plants that he'd collected not only along the coast but also inland. And he wrote up his descriptions in this five volume series entitled illustrations of the zoology of South Africa. He not only described the species, but he did his own illustrations. And here you can see some of his illustrations of the cat shark and of the South African uh, rock python. There's his illustration of uh, the first white shark that he came across in, in the Western Cape. 
which he called Carcharodon capensis. This is the only cosmopolitan or widely distributed shark that was actually described from a South African specimen. And it was described by Andrew Smith in 1829 from a specimen that uh, stranded in, in Table Bay. And what was interesting was that he, he gave it the, the, the generic name of Rhinodon. And we see that in the literature, there were four different uh, names used for it. And eventually, the um, International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature decided that Rhinodon would be the generic name for the whale shark. John Gilchrist is widely recognized as the founder of South African marine science. He was also a Scot, and he was appointed uh, to work for the Department of Agriculture in the Cape Colony, and he first came to South Africa in 1896. But unlike Smith, he stayed here, and he eventually became involved with what was then the South African College, which is now the University of Cape Town, and the Zoology Department, and he also held responsibilities in the South African Museum. And he was responsible for uh, a number of expeditions up and down the coast. He managed to acquire a, an old Scottish trawler, the Peter Fora, and he did a number of expeditions up and down the coast. And in amongst all his other contributions to marine zoology, he described several endemic species of sharks and rays. Unfortunately, he, um, he, he basically took on too much and um, there was a little bit of conflict and as a result he was, he was relieved of his responsibilities at the South African Museum and Keppel Barnard was appointed um, as the, the first um, no, sorry, not the first uh, scientist at the South African Museum, but one of the, one of the first marine uh, zoologists. Interesting, with a name like Barnard, you would assume that he came from South Africa. But in fact, this was not the case. He was from England. He studied at Cambridge. He not only studied uh, botany and zoology, but after that, he decided to qualify as, as a lawyer. So he studied law, and then came out to South Africa to replace uh, Gilchrist. And he and Gilchrist seemed to uh, form a very um, complementary team, and they increased our knowledge on South African marine fauna, and in particular, the, the Chondrichthians. He, um, he didn't spend his entire career, Bonner didn't spend his entire career working on, on sharks and rays, and he became better known for his work on South African mollusks. Two of his colleagues who followed much later at the South African Museum were Butch Hulley, who worked in the 70s on the taxonomy of the Rajids, and then more recently Leonard Campagno, who moved from Grahamstown and was based at the South African Museum uh, for nearly two decades, where he was responsible for updating the uh, FAO volume on the sharks and rays of the world. Rhodes University, uh, probably one of the most significant characters there was J.L.B. Smith. He was not a zoologist, he was in fact a professor of chemistry, but he was an avid angler with a huge amount of interest in marine fishes. Um, probably best known for his uh, discovery of the South African coelacan. But he wrote a number of papers on the sharks and rays of South Africa, and probably most significantly was his contribution in producing the, the uh, fish identification reference uh, which is now known as, as Smith Sea Fishes. In recognition of his contribution, Rhodes University formed the JLB Smith Institute of Ichthyology, which later became known as the South African Institute of Aquatic Biodiversity. And then two important role players there, Phil Hemstra, who is still there, although he's very much in a retired capacity, and Len Campagno, who um, spent several years at uh, the JLB Smith Institute when he first came to South Africa and both these individuals have had a huge role in producing um, reference books for the identification <coughs> and improvement of knowledge on the sharks and rays of, of Southern Africa and in, in, in Leonard's case um, our, our global knowledge. 
Um, Leonard, together with his one of his uh, PhD students, in fact, I think it was his first PhD student, uh, Dave Ebert, who came out from California, and Malcolm Smale, who is based at the Port Elizabeth Museum, produced this um, popular reference guide to sharks and rays of Southern Africa. And Malcolm, I understand Dave's updating it. We're producing another. I think he's updating sharks of the world. Okay. Not this particular. Not this particular volume. Um, sadly, I think this is out of print. In fact, it's been so for for a long period of time. So there's certainly a, a, a need to to update this this particular um, publication. <coughs> Moving uh, further north, up into Natal. There were some major events in terms of shark attack in the province in the, in the 1950s. Um, the province was literally gripped by um, shark attack. And what was particularly significant was the economic effect that those shark attacks had on the, on the coastal economy. As a result, in 1961, the Anti-Shark Research Association was formed, which was basically a, um, a fundraising vehicle um, to further shark research and research into prevention of shark attack in the province. And this was um, succeeded later, a few years later, by the formation of the what was then known as the Natal Anti-Shark Measures Board, which was in those early days really um, an advisory organization, advising local authorities if they wanted to install nets, how to do it, um, and literally no more than that. The, the spate of shark attacks in the province led to the, was one of the catalysts for the formation of the Oceanographic Research Institute in 1959. Um, its first director, David Davies, um, he had originally worked in Cape Town with sea fisheries, looking at, uh, at sardines and plankton. And he was the, the first director, and he was particularly interested in the issues of, of shark attack. Sadly, he, um, he was killed at the age of, what, 43? So he was really in his prime. And, and I think it's probably true to say that a lot of the impetus of the early shark research at Ori was directly attributable to David's drive and initiative and his, his death obviously had a negative impact on uh, the, the research efforts. Never, he was also responsible for, for, for writing this book uh, entitled About Sharks and Shark Attack. But despite his death, the research on sharks continued at Ori through until about 1975. And the initial shark program was a very ambi ambitious one. Um, attempting to achieve a number of different objectives. Obviously, they had the, the advantage of being situated right on the, sorry, right on the beachfront. There's the sea, seashore there. And they had a shark research tank there and a number, small, number of smaller um, research tanks in which they could conduct various shark um, experiments. One of the most important things was to work out what shark species were in the area. Um, and Ori were fortunate in that shark nets had been installed in Durban as early as 1952. So those shark nets provided a ready source of biological material for David Davies <coughs> and subsequent researchers at, at Ori. I think we're all very, very familiar with this series of publications by John Bass who's here, Jeanette de Aubrey, and that Kista Sammy. Um, this is my particular copy, and you can see it's, it's, the binding has collapsed completely. It's certainly a well-worn and very well-used reference. Um, I think there were, a uh, in total, there were five, uh, five of these ORI investigation reports, and they've really proved to be an absolute bible of, uh, of information for anybody with any sort of interest in in the sharks of the, of the South African coast. <coughs> John Wallace was also at Ori at the time, and he was responsible for producing uh, similar guides on the a series of three on the batoids of um, 
on the east coast of southern Africa. John subsequently carried on to do a, a PhD looking at the estuarine fish um, in St. Lucia. Beulah Davis was the founder and the first director of the Natal Anti-Shark Measures Board, as it was known in those days. She herself was a uh, zoologist by training, and she had this vision that the shark nets would provide an excellent uh, biological sampling tool to give us an indication of the species and abundance of sharks along the, along the east coast. The first researcher was Tim Wallet. Unfortunately, I don't think he and Bueller got on very well, um, which may be in retrospect and with due respect to Bueller, um, quite a difficult person to work with. And it was only after Tim had left that he, he also produced a book on, uh, on shark attack and sharks of the South African coast. The two of them obviously had a very difficult time and that was this period here, when there were five attacks at the Manzimtoti, which at the time was a protected beach. I don't want to dwell too much um, other than to acknowledge the role that Sheldon has played in, in shark research. You can see that uh, that has now come to an end. Sheldon left the Sharks Board in February this year. He's moved to DAF as the editor-in-chief of the African... Journal of Marine Science. But Sheldon has, has played a huge role in the 25 <coughs> odd years that he spent at the Sharks Board. Now, another role player in shark research that many of you may not be aware of, and that was the National Physical Research Laboratory, an arm of the CSIR. And this was largely as a result of the spate of shark attacks in the Tel in the late 1950s. Um, their physicists decided that maybe they could produce an electrical shark cable which would provide a, a barrier against a shark attack. They initiated some research in St. Lucia. That didn't last very long, I think, mainly because they battled to find uh, research animals. But the research continued, and they decided that, they would, that Margate would be the ideal test site so on three separate occasions, they installed a big electrical shark cable off the beaches at Margate with a view to trying to evaluate whether this, in fact, was going to repel sharks. But for a number of different reasons, and I don't have time to go into them now, this never, ever really um, saw the light of day. I was involved um, with the, the testing at Margate in 1981 when I worked at Ori, and there you can see the cable on the beach being uncoiled. It was, it was probably this sort of thickness, so it was a huge structure, and it was attached to these uh, large buoys and then pulled out through the surf. And the idea was one, once the cable was in position, the buoys would be cut and then the cable would sink down and lie on the uh, on the seabed. And um, some of you may have heard the name Eddie Smith, uh, who was a pioneer, and that's Eddie there, together with his colleagues from the CSR and the NPRL. NPRL. Tried again in 1988. This time, uh, the Sharks Board was intimately involved in the testing, and we decided that Maybe the best thing to do would be to try and catch sharks offshore, hold them in this tank on the beach, and when they'd recovered from the stress of capture, take them out of the tank and then release them in the inshore zone with small surface markers to see, in fact, whether they could, in fact, penetrate the cable and head, head out, to, uh, out to sea. Sharks Board has been involved in electrical barrier research or electrical repairance for a long time. We produced the, uh, the shark pod back in the 1990s. In the last few years, we've been given a generous grant from the province to carry on the research in the hope that we can, in fact, come up with an electrical shark cable. And Paul has been intimately involved in the project. And he and I are going down to Cape Town to meet with IMT we've contracted to do a lot of the development work for us. So the, 
there certainly is is a little bit more light in the in the long and dark tunnel of uh, development of an electric shark cable. White sharks have been hanging around seal colonies for hundreds, thousands of years, but it was only in the in the late 80s, early 90s, that people realized that firstly there was an ecotourism opportunity and with that um, an opportunity for conducting shark research. And if you look at Sheldon's review of white shark research, you will see that the shark nets have obviously played a major role in providing material and information for that research, but in terms of seal colonies, also very, very large, but note very, very recent. Looks like one paper here, two papers in the 90s, but a plethora of publications in the, in the 2000s. Some of the major role players, and in fact, they, they can be regarded very much as pioneers. They were the first people. Although they're still active today, they, they were um, very much the pioneers in, in this research. We've had a number of overseas people coming to conduct research um, on white sharks. I would hesitate to include Chris as, as a researcher, because he's not. He's a movie maker, but I think we need to acknowledge the significant contribution that he provided by bringing his research vessel to South Africa last year to be able to conduct some extensive uh, tracking research on, on white sharks, and I'm hoping that we're going to hear a little bit more about that during the course of the, of the symposium. So, what, what to the future of South African shark and ray research? Just a couple of personal um, observations. Firstly, um, I'm a little bit worried about taxonomic aspects of it. Is there enough taxonomy going on? Many people might say, oh, but we've described all the species. But I think we, we've overlooked the fact that with uh, techniques such as genetics, we're able to look more closely at, at shark taxonomy. And I think that maybe this is, um, there is possibly a gap there. Uh, Leonard had a PhD student, Brett Humon, who looked at the, an Australian, who looked at the taxonomy of the cat sharks. Unfortunately, Brett went back to Australia and even more sadly, he passed away a few years ago. So I think that there is uh, there, there's definitely a void there that needs to be, to be filled. In terms of endemics, I spoke earlier about the high incidence of endemics, and I think it's important to not to overlook those animals. There's always the temptation to say, well, we'll get round to them another day. We're more interested in the charismatic megafauna, and I think a good indication of that is the fact that looking at the number of papers at this symposium, a third of them are devoted to white sharks, and it's exactly the same as the situation that we encountered when we had the inaugural symposium in Durban two years ago, in that a third of the presentations were, were focused on, on white sharks. So I think one, one needs to be careful to not to overlook the other species, particularly the endemics. I think one of the features about our research these days is the, the collaboration. Um, a lot of research on sharks is not something that you can do on your own. We, 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 a typical example of that was the, the platform provided by uh, Chris Fisher and OSearch, which enabled a lot of different people to come together and to work together. And I think that this is something that we, we have to encourage. Um, it's very easy to work independently, collect data independently, but unless that data is going to be published, uh, it's essentially lost to science. And by collaborating uh, both locally and internationally, encouraging students to get involved, we can ensure that we get a maximum return on the data that has been collected and the species that we have at our disposal. At our disposal. In terms of new technology, it's just amazing the technology that's available. Um, <coughs> mated remote underwater video cameras are being used extensively. I know in False Bay they're using them. They're being used 
on the Transguide Coast. This is an amazing tool. Uh, stable isotope work, uh, genetics, um, satellite tagging, uh, acoustic tagging, telemetry. All these are incredibly useful tools um, to improve our knowledge. And I'm pleased to say that they are being used in this country. Unfortunately, they are often very, very expensive, and that is why we often need to involve collaborators uh, from other parts of the world who may have access to the technology and the equipment, and we can work together with them to use that equipment in furthering our knowledge on South African um, sharks and rays. I've touched already on, on new vehicles for research, and I think there the O-Search was a very, very good example of that. I know it was controversial. Um, a number of people were violently opposed to them coming to South Africa, um, but I think at the end of the day we can look back, and although I'm saying this more as an outsider because I wasn't intimately involved, that um, they brought huge benefits uh, to our understanding of South Africa sharks and rays. And then in terms of international exposure, just a, a reminder that we're on track to host shark, the second Sharks International Symposium um, in Durban in June 2014, we being uh, the Sharks Board. The inaugural Sharks International was in Cairns, Australia in 2010, and we agreed to, to host the, the, the sequel to that in Durban. 2014. So I'm hoping that virtually all of you sitting here now will, will join us in what is just over a year's time in Durban. Because we're hoping that we will attract a large number of international researchers and the opportunity for interaction with, with international researchers is relatively limited. And here is, here is, is a platform or an invitation to, to take advantage of it right here on our Finally, uh, just an apology to all those who I haven't been able to include, and I'm hoping that if somebody decides to provide us with a similar a talk on the same lines in five or ten years, that they will be able to um, feature some of the people who are illustrated here. Thank you. <laughs>